So in the last video, we talked about fusion in the sun, how it produces the incredible amount of energy that the sun comes out. But the only way we can force those protons together is by this incredible blanket of mass. But of course, fusion is not only something that happens in the sun. There's a lot of research going on into fusion on Earth. So today, I'm very pleased to interview uh, Cormac Kaur, who's actually my co-lecturer in a different course we teach, and is a researcher here at the ANU on fusion. So Cormac, why is nuclear fusion on Earth, why would it be good? Why is anyone bothering? Well, the coming decades are going to be very important in establishing a pathway forward for the, for the world in order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And essentially, up until now, we've been very reliant on uh, coal and gas and oil, which produce harmful gases. So what we need is large-scale infrastructure that can provide our cities with uh, electricity. And fusion energy is one of the ways uh, to do this. Now, the thing with, with fusion is it's very difficult to do, and I'll, I'll get onto that in a minute. But what we're essentially doing is we're fusing together um, two protons um, at very high temperatures. And what results is a heavier particle, which is going to be helium, and a lot of en energy. Now, whenever you create this energy, we produce uh, neutrons, which essentially go through a water blanket uh, create steam, and then turn some turbines. Now, for fusion energy, there are some very important uh, aspects to it. Number one, it has got no carbon dioxide emissions. Number two, um, it can create enough baseload power in order to generate enough electricity for a city. Uh, number three, if anything goes wrong with it, a number of years ago, you may remember the Fukushima nuclear uh, reactor in uh, Japan. Uh, which fails, if anything goes wrong with the fusion, with fusion energy, it just shuts down. Essentially, the plasma that creates the fusion reactions cool, and everything just switches off. So, so it's what's, what's, safe. what's the fuel for, for fusion reactor? You're not using uranium, are you? We're not using, no, not using uranium. Um, for one of the reactors in the south of France, uh, it's going to be uh, forms of hydrogen. Uh, in particular, uh, it's going to be deuterium and tritium. And these are readily available. Deuterium can be obtained from various forms of water, uh, and tritium can be, be produced through reactions with lithium. So it's a sustainable, uh, clean energy um, uh, process. So you're not doing quite the same process as in the sun, which is just hydrogen to helium. You're actually using the isotopes of hydrogen to make this a bit easier. Yes, that's correct. But there's still plenty of these things available on Earth. And there's still plenty of these things available on Earth in order to create. So you're never going to run out of energy. How about the waste products? Uh, well, there's no there's waste products. the problem with normal nuclear fuel fission. That's right. Well, there's no harmful radioactive waste um, in that long uh, term. Uh, if anything, uh, the uh, materials that are used in a fusion reactor can be used again within uh, 100 years. Besides that, there's no harmful gases which are given off, um, so it's not going to pollute the environment. We've talked about how difficult fusion is on the sun. You need this incredible weight pushing down. But how can you possibly do that on Earth? You don't have 10 to the 30 kilograms of hydrogen to sit on top of your gas and make it hot and dense enough to sustain the fusion. So how can you get, the, get those protons close enough? This is true, and it's always been one of the, the biggest challenges for fusion energy. Uh, essentially, what we do on Earth, what we're looking to do is recreate the sun in a box. In order to do that, we produce uh, a plasma, which is an ionized gas. And by, uh, because the plasma is an ionized gas that consists of electrons and positive particles, positive ions, we can confine them by a magnetic field. So the idea here on Earth is to confine a plasma using a magnetic field to heat this plasma up to very high temperatures of about 150 million degrees Celsius so that we can overcome that barrier that's preventing the, the protons from fusing together. Once we overcome that barrier, uh, fusion is going to occur and the fusion reactions will occur. Now, one of the challenges though, is the number of fusion reactions depends on essentially the size of your plasma. So scientists know that in order to make um, fusion viable, let's say at the moment, we need to go bigger. The more plasma volume you have, the more fusion reactions you have. And the challenge at the moment is to demonstrate that you can get net fusion power out um, of the device compared to the amount of power you're actually putting in. And that's been one of the biggest challenges. So the temperatures we're talking about are much higher than the sun. I mean, the sun's what, 16, 17 million degrees in the middle. You're talking about 10 times hotter than that. But the density is a lot lower. You can't maintain anything like the density in the middle of the sun, 150 tons per cubic meter. That's right. And you're also using the isotopes of hydrogen rather than pure hydrogen. That's correct. 
And the uh, reaction of choice at the moment is deuterium and tritium um, because that's a very um, a strong reaction at about 150 million degrees Celsius. And again, the trick is to have a high confinement time. So to be able to, to confine the plasma for a long time, to get those high temperatures together, uh, and to make the particles fuse together. So those are the big challenges. Uh, to date, we have only ever, we've never been able to um, demonstrate net fusion power uh, out. And that's what the ITER fusion reactor is, is about. So right now, the, the biggest thing in the fusion world is ITER, an incredibly massive, expensive uh, fusion project that's going to go to scale, as you were just saying, being constructed in the south of France, and you're a member of the team for this. Mm -hmm. So can you explain what ITER is doing and why? So ITER is a, a tokamak. Essentially, it's, it's a, a giant vacuum vessel that's going to create a plasma uh, to heat it to high temperatures. Now, the goal for ITER is to demonstrate that you can get net fusion power out. The idea is to put 50 megawatts of power into the device and get 500 megawatts out. Okay, that's a pretty big markup. Which is a pretty big markup. Now, the thing with ITER is uh, it's not going to be captured, as in it's an experimental device in order to demonstrate that, that nuclear fusion is a viable pathway forward. So you have all the neutrons flooding out, but you not, don't have the blanket of water around to collect them and turn them into steam and so that, on. That's correct. Um, now, you did mention there that it that is a, an expensive project, but there are many other projects, of course, out there that have been as expensive. And, of course, if we can solve the fusion energy uh, barrier, um, we're going to create a lot of electricity for the world. Now, it is one of the greatest engineering and um, scientific challenges out there. We have countries from all over the world that are coming together to develop ITER and to build ITER in the south of France. Some components are being built in China, some components are being built in, in India, in the United States, in Europe, and they all have to be brought to the south of France to Catarache and be assembled, almost like Lego bricks. What's your involvement in the involvement of ANU in this? So one of the great challenges, and as you mentioned, essentially um, what we're trying to do is recreate the sun here on Earth. Now, one of the challenges... Preferably without destroying the Earth in the process. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, but one of the challenges is, if we're going to create the sun here on Earth, what's, and we're trying to put the sun into a box, what's that box going to look at? What materials can we use that can actually contain that box? Um, and what materials will not melt whenever you bring that, that, if you like, that artificial sun into contact with those materials? So my program is to study materials that can be used in a fusion reactor um, and that can withstand that really harsh, environment that's created. So let's have a sense of the scale of it, because this is an enormously expensive, very big project. Here in the background, we have what for a long time was the biggest plasma physics experiment in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, the Stellarator, I think it was called. Yeah. So how much bigger than this is the chamber at ITER? That's right. So this, this uh, device was, was built here and operation for about 25 years. Uh, ITER itself is going to be about 10 times bigger than this device. It's an absolutely enormous device um, uh, that is being built, and a person looks absolutely minuscule in comparison to it. So you've got this contained like donut of sun at 150 million degrees. Obviously, you can't let that near the walls because it would melt them. How do you keep 150 million degrees away from metal, which can only survive like 1,000 degrees? Um, so this is one of the, the big challenges. But how we do this is by uh, uh, confining the plasma and those charged particles in a magnetic field. So um, it must be a very strong magnetic and it's field. A, it's, it's an extremely strong magnetic field to keep it away. Um, but there are some um, parts of the chamber which will come into direct contact with the fusion, and we need to come up with some uh, interesting uh, ways in which to keep the plasma away from it. Now, ever since I was given the junior science encyclopedia when I was nine years old, we were talking about fusion as the great power source of the future. And it was always 10 years in the future and has been 10 years in the future for all of my lifetime now. And I must admit, I feel fairly skeptical about this. I mean, we're seeing a world in which the price of renewable energy is dropping very fast. And yet the only hope of having a self-sustaining fusion reaction that's net positive is to spend many, many, many billions of dollars on ITER. So do you seriously think we're going to get this to the stage where it can be commercially viable in your lifetime or my lifetime? So that's a very, very good question. And indeed, there's a lot of um, private companies out there at the moment that are developing uh, different forms of um, tokamaks and fusion reactors 
in order to make fusion a success. Uh, like you, I'm also skeptical. I believe back in the, the 60s, every home was going to have a mini tokamak in the kitchen table, which was... I believe Iron Man has a portable fusion reactor on his chest. Portable, <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, um, but with the eater, with the eater experiment, it will, um, hopefully, it will demonstrate that we can get net fusion uh, power out. That's kind of the first step. Uh, that will be in about 10 years' time. Uh, after that, there are plans to uh, develop a demonstration power plant, which would then be uh, connected to the grid to produce uh, electricity. Now, again, there's been a lot of development in the last 50 years uh, on fusion. We need to be careful about getting ahead of ourselves uh, in promising it in 10 years or 15 years' time. But the developments have been significant. Uh, great progress has been made. But I'd be very careful about promising that's going to be in the next 20 or 30 years. So not in the next 20 or 30 years, but you think maybe on a, like a 50-year time scale, uh, you could actually have cost-effective fusion power? I think so. I think with the developments and the scientific challenges that have been undertaken and also overcome, it's on a very good pathway to achieving that. Great. Well, thank you for that, Cormac. We'll have you back in a few videos' time to talk about your plasma research. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate it.